thank you all for coming. I'm Rebecca Yale. Uh, I've been a photographer since I was about 11 years old. Uh, I started shooting weddings in 2012. Um, we were just chatting earlier. My first wedding uh, in New York was the weekend of Hurricane Sandy, um, trial by fire. Um, very fun. I can tell that story later. Um, but I started in photography um, as a kid, uh, traveling, just loving documenting things as I was going along. And I started assisting different photographers and I grew up in LA, in the LA area, and decided to go to NYU to be a fashion photographer. That was my plan. And I worked for a bunch of fashion photographers and very quickly realized that was not what I wanted to do. Uh, so I did a pretty sharp turn and what I was studying, I'm gonna take these off because I feel like they're jangling a little bit. Um, Sorry. Um, what I was studying at school was the photographers whose work had really created dramatic social change uh, in the US. Um, people like Lewis Hine and Jacob Reese, the FSA photographers, Walker Evans, Dorothy Lang, um, who I highly recommend Googling all of them if you don't know their work. Um, but they were the people who brought the end to the tenement laws and overturned child labor in America, helped bring around the New Deal. And I became really passionate about making photos that could change the world. And I started doing, um, let's see if this works, yep, there we go. Um, so I started doing nature and wildlife photography uh, and did that for about like four or five years. Uh, and I would uh, go to Antarctica, Rwanda, different places and shoot. And um, a lot of that was, uh, I was working with Getty Images, um, they were selling my photos of stock and I was working with different NGOs and I was applying for grants, but then that would really just pay for the different trips and I would come home and I was doing portrait and kind of lifestyle work, really like whoever would pay me. I was doing pets, I was doing dating profile photos, like really whoever would pay me. Um, and that's what was paying my rent. Um, and um, that's in my early fashion work too on the bottom there, um, which I still love. Um, and weddings were the absolute last thing on my mind uh, during this time. Um, to me, weddings were, I'd never been to a wedding other than when I was six years old, and it was all in Hebrew in a temple, and I cried because I didn't understand any of it and was very sad. Um, so to me, weddings were kind of cheesy and old school and not very artistic at all. And it wasn't until 2011 that my cousin got married and I she got married on a farm in Vermont and wore like this cool blue dress and it was like early days of Style Me Pretty and there were all these like fun details in it and I just completely fell in love. Uh, I stalked her photographer. I was totally that annoying person that if you guys are wedding photographers, we all hate, who's like, what are you doing? What are you doing all day? Uh, and luckily she was nicer to me. Um, then I always am to guess who do that. Uh, and she kind of explained as we were going and I realized that weddings were these incredible like epic fashion portrait shoots uh, and you can create these grand romantic images a lot like what I had loved about fashion photography. And uh, then after the wedding, um, Unfortunately, my grandfather got pretty sick and um, passed away quickly after, but was very healthy and happy at the wedding. And those photos just took on a whole new meaning to me. And all of a sudden I realized that these aren't like flippant party events, which like when I'm a young 20 year old, that's kind of what I thought. Uh, and that they're actually these incredible incredibly emotional, important days that like they might, those photos might not change the world, but they're going to be incredibly important to the family that I'm taking them for. And the gravitas of that um, just appealed to me immensely. And I fell in love with the idea of being able to photograph every, I say to my clients, um, you will have every spectrum of the human emotion scale on your wedding day. And it is my job to capture and document it. Uh, and that's what I love about weddings. I love that I get to do that. Um, so that's kind of my path into weddings. Uh, and what we're going to chat about today um, is defining your voice as an artist. So that long-winded of how I got into it is still very much who I am as an artist. And it's 
um, the mix of the fashion and documentary is a huge part of my work. Uh, it's I use it constantly throughout my branding, on my Instagram, on my website, everywhere I talk about my background and how I combine these styles. Uh, I also studied aesthetic philosophy at NYU, which we're going to talk a little bit about, but I promise it's fun. Um, and uh, I use that throughout. And that's so the most common question that I get asked and why I thought it would be fun to talk about this here is how do I break into the luxury wedding market and then how do I move up in it? Like how do you get how do you get great clients? How do you get these weddings? Like where do you start? And there's a ton of different ways into it. Uh, there's amazing marketing and branding and I know incredible photographers or incredible branding people who are not incredible photographers and charging more than I do. Um, so you can go into it many different ways. Uh, and I love um, the, I use um, Richard Photo Lab to process my film and the head of the lab said something wonderful um, on a podcast that if there's someone out there who's you're frustrated because your work's better than theirs and they're booking more weddings and charging more money, that's on you to like elevate your branding and marketing. Um, but what I can say is how I found my way into kind of the luxury destination wedding market was not as much focusing on that and was focusing on being a, an artist. I was an artist first and a business person second and luckily they like came together in a way that worked really nicely. Uh, and what I think when you're the best artist you can be is you're making yourself a commodity. As a photographer, all we have is our artistry. That is our commodity. That's what we're selling. So the more unique you make yourself as an artist, the higher price you can command because, and the more desired you'll be because no one else can do what you're doing. You're, when someone's hiring you, they're hiring your unique voice as an artist and no one else is going to be able to take the same photo or same video or the same perspective because that's, that's what your commodity is. That's what you're selling. Um, uh, and that's what I always try to make clear to my clients, to planners, um, on my own Instagram, throughout my branding, that when you're hiring me, you're getting a very cohesive, you know what you're gonna get. They know um, my work is, feels very consistent uh, and that you're getting something solid and tangible that no one else can deliver. And of course, I mean, there's a million other amazing photographers, but it's true, anyone, whether you're a great photographer or an awful photographer, you're gonna deliver something different than the person standing next to you. We could put, uh, this was like one of my first high school assignments was a flower um, in a bud vase and our teacher had us all take, um, we one by one went into the room and took a photo of it so we couldn't see what each other was doing. And then we all compared photos afterwards and it was the exact same lighting scenario. Um, exact same situation like no one touched or moved the flower and all of our photos looked so very different and that's um, I mean I'm sure for any of you who've gone to photo school you've done similar uh, projects and that's what weddings can be is we can all shoot the exact same wedding the exact same conditions and have totally different perspectives on it um, so that is my starting advice on how you break into this market and how you command higher pricing is by making yourself the best artist you can be um, so, um, all you have is your brand, um, which yes, there's a ma million things that you can do with branding and marketing, but your brand should be um, very cohesive of you as an artist. So every image that you post should be in service of your brand. Um, you should, uh, every image should appeal to your target bride or groom, uh, and you should know who your target client is. Um, there's a million different kinds of luxury. I kind of hate using that word, but I didn't really know what else to call it. Uh, but there's, um, you know, the bride who reads Martha Stewart and the bride who reads Grace Armand is a very different bride and they work with different planners and different florists and knowing which one you want to work with, and you can want to work with both, that's fine, but the image you post for the bride who's reading Martha Stewart um, might not appeal to that Grace Armand one and the Grace Armand loving bride is probably, or the Martha Stewart loving bride is probably gonna think the Grace Armand stuff is tacky and vice versa. Um, or overly romantic, like whatever the word is. So you really want to kind of study who your ideal bride is, like know where they eat, know where they shop, know what magazines, or I mean magazines are kind of dead sadly, but know what websites they go on, know like what 
what they tag and post and um, everything should be in service of that client um, because you are judged on things that have nothing to do with you. And this is always one of the hardest um, when I'm teaching workshops or working with my mentees um, to get them to understand that if your bride has like a tacky clip in their hair or like nails that your ideal bride is gonna find tacky, that ideal bride is not going to hire you because of your other bride's nails. And that has nothing to do with you. It's not to do anything with your photography, um, but they see like tacky client equals tacky photographer. Uh, and it was really interesting to be on the other side of it when I was helping my sister hire her photographer. And she is pretty well educated in photography because I've been doing it my whole life and talked to her about it. But we would look at different photographers' portfolios and see like purple uplighting. And she'd be like, ugh, so tacky. And I'd be like, that had nothing to do with the photographer. And like they lit it beautifully with that purple uplighting. Um, like the photographer did a really good job with that situation. And she's like, yeah, but if they're posting it, it means they like it, which means they have no taste. And I was like, okay, that's not really a reflection on the photographer's taste, but the more I thought about it, the more it kind of is. You're showing with what you're posting what you like and what you're thinking is beautiful that you want to share, and your client is thinking about that. So um, these are like screenshots from my Instagram um, of like just different grids, and you can see it feels pretty consistent. They're all different images, there's different tones, and my like people have very different approaches to Instagram, and that's a whole different class that I'm not I'm not going to be the one to teach it at all. Um, I just kind of post what I think is pretty, um, and mine tends to be a little bit busier than a lot of other people's because. My photographs are a little bit busier than a lot of other kind of people with these tones, I'd say. Um, but I try to make sure that every, or I do make sure that every photo I am posting is in service of the client that I want to attract. Um, okay, so we're gonna start. Um, I said I'm gonna talk a little bit of aesthetic philosophy. Um, I promise it's not scary, uh, but we're gonna uh, start with semiotics, um, which like this was kind of my study at NYU. Semiotics, for anyone who hasn't heard that word before, is the study of signs and symbols. It's kind of, uh, it's fun. It's like cognitive behavioral therapy. It's uh, the idea of how our brains work. It's visual language. It's how we interpret things. Uh, so when we, read like just the way we would deep read a novel uh, or a poem or like anything you've done in like literature class uh, you're doing the same with a photograph when you're and everyone is from like an infant to um, anyone who can see uh, you are looking at an image you're deriving information you're taking information from it processing it and deciding if you like it, if you don't like it, creating an opinion. Uh, you're reading that image in a certain way and we can harness the way that someone does that to create uh, stronger photos because there's all of these like evolutionary like uh, not tactics, but um, like particulars that we all are universally, uni universally find appealing. Um, things like pyramids, triangles, the Fibonacci spiral, golden triangles. Uh, I'll go over these, I promise. Um, um, uh, circles, like they're things that all of our eyes just like because of thousands and thousands of years of evolution. Uh, and if we know about them, we can harness them. Um, so that's where I'm going to start is how we can use uh, visual language to create stronger images. And I want to say that like when I when I talk about all of this stuff, I want to make sure that I'm making clear that I'm never trying to teach people to be like mini me's like I that would be like this like the most awful thing that I could ever do. What I want is these are building blocks of visual language. So just how you would learn an alphabet uh, when you're learning another language and then you learn how to make words and then you learn how to string them together and you create poetry or sentences or novels. That's the same as what this visual language is. So you can use these tools to create whatever your own art is. It should all be building blocks. And whether you're shooting weddings or anything else, it doesn't have, none of this is specific to weddings. And for any of you who've seen my flat course um, you're probably like oh, a lot of this is familiar um, and that's what I always joke that like I got this is what I loved and started talking about first and when I was like oh who wants to hear about aesthetic philosophy and like no one cares um, and I'm like oh who wants to like make pretty flat lays and like get better clients and then everybody cares um, so flat lays were kind of like my like devious little plan to like teach composition um, in a like very um, uh, simple way that like made sense um, so now we're going to apply a lot of those tactics, for anyone who's seen that, to um, things other than flat lays. 
Um, so the first thing that I like to start with is movement flow and focus. And that's like, just as I was saying, you deep read an image. This is how we start to deep read an image. Uh, all photographs have movement and we flow through them and then we focus on a certain point and we can control how our viewer does that by our compositions. Um, so there's a few different tools of how we do this and I won't go like too crazy into them, um, but you can Google all of them um, or like ask me later. Um, but the Fibonacci spiral, um, this is um, a very complicated mathematical sequence by Fibonacci, but it basically creates that spiral shape um, that you're seeing there. And that's kind of like perfect composition, um, as said by Fibonacci. Um, and you can uh, do it in different directions. And it's actually really fun for everyone who uses Lightroom. Uh, in the crop tool, you can actually overlay the Fibonacci spiral over your images um, and see. And you can, like, I think it's Shift O to like flip it so it goes in all the different directions. And you can see like how it's actually looking. Like This was a screenshot from Lightroom, and I just went over it in red. Um, so you can see it a little bit better. Um, but you can kind of test how well your image is working. And certain images you might be able to overlay the spiral multiple times in. But um, the idea is you enter the image in a particular place. Um, the um, And we all uh, bring our own gray matter to things as well. So we all might enter the image in different places. Um, like in the evolution side of things, we tend to like bright, shiny, sparkly. Um, that's why we like diamonds and like rhinestones on dresses. Um, we're kind of like birds. Um, we also like um, contrast and um, big differential things. So like I like brighter things. So when I, I start at her dress, um, but if you like are more into the contrast in your brain, you might start at um, his uh, suit because that's the black is a big pop in there. Um, but you, we also all bring our own gray Matter. Like you might be more interested in fashion and start at her dress, or you might think the groom is really cute and start at him. So that's where like we all bring our own uh, backgrounds um, into an image. Um, but the general idea is once you're in the image, you follow a very certain path, and that's how we create stronger images. And when you have that like point, like I know a lot of this is like why does it really matter? Like as long as my images are good and my clients are happy, but trying to get those higher end clients and jump those price points and like attract those higher end planners and designers and all of that, it's you need to capture people and bring them into your images. And how you do that is by trapping them in your image. And how you trap someone in an image is good composition. Uh, I think like the statistic now is like 0.01 seconds of like how much time it takes on Instagram for someone to decide if they're gonna like double tap or scroll right past. And even if they double tap, the actual then like extra effort to click on your name and like go to your profile, like that's pretty rare that that happens. And the longer you're keeping someone in your image, the longer or the better chance that it, they're going to like convert into a potential client or a follower or whatever it is. Um, so that's where these compositional techniques become really important. So in addition to the Fibonacci spiral, we have the golden triangles. Um, so most of you have probably seen this rule of thirds grid. Uh, the golden triangles is very, so like it kind of ends up, like they all kind of end up with the same thing and they're just different techniques of getting there. Um, but it's kind of these more like pyramid shapes and it's basically you draw um, a line. Do I have a laser? Yeah, I do. Um, you draw ooh, a line um, from the top to the bottom um, of the, Rule, uh, rule of thirds grid. And then from the other angles, you draw a straight line to there. Um, and you can, again, like shift that into any way. Um, and then where those intersect, which you'll also see is the rule of thirds grid, um, is where you want like your pinnacle focus of the image when you're creating something strong. And then you can see how it makes those pyramid shapes. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, um, okay. Uh, so how that can actually like work in a real image uh, is creating um, all of those triangular shapes that here see it. Um, so we've got the pyramid. It's this one is much higher um, at like the top of her head than like the smaller triangle there. But where the smaller triangle would be would be right around the top of that bouquet, which catches the eye really nicely. The light is caught there. You've got the detail of the rhinestones um, in her dress there. Uh, and that's, um, that's where my eye gets drawn to. Um, 
you might catch another detail first, but everything about this uh, keeps you engaged where I want you. You're not gonna like jut off or get trapped anywhere. Uh, all of the lines of the veil like reinforce the pyramid shape. Her arm brings you down and around to there. The bouquet brings you upwards and then her line of sight like connects these two pieces and brings you back up and around. So everything kind of keeps you trapped in this moment. Uh, and obviously I look at, we all look at our own images and we see things that someone else is not going to see. So I look at this and I see it as such an emotional moment because it was the moment when the uh, bride's father passed her off from um, from like his arm to the groom and she was crying and like I can see that and I can, this wedding was like six years ago and I still feel the emotion of like standing right next to her taking this image um, and it was an early wedding for me too so it was like a super emotional moment to see and photograph and that's not something that you guys are all gonna see when you see this image. You're gonna see like you don't even know what moment in the wedding day this is um, it, it could be so many different things so creating a strong composition and a image that stands for itself is so important because we like all my photo teachers used to say like you have to create like images with muscles like they have to be strong enough to take a beat down because you can't be there to defend it like your photos need to live without captions um, and that's where composition becomes so important um, I use um, the triangles all the time. Um, you can kind of see here uh, how I'm using uh, triangular shapes over and over again uh, to create images that keep you engaged inside of them. Uh, and I have a lot of what I call go-tos. Like when I said that we wanna create cohesive, consistent work where like when someone is investing, and I mean, I hate to, I hate to use money because weddings, even if, some, if someone's spending $5 or $50,000, uh, it doesn't matter, it's still their wedding and it's still so important and we should treat every single one with the same reverence. Um, but what helps you command those higher prices as you move up uh, is them knowing that if they are investing that higher amount of money in you, they know exactly what they're gonna get. And I never want to have my work feel super repetitive. I don't want it to feel like bride A, B, C stuck in like this one situation and it all looks the same. Every couple, every bride and groom is different and I wanna make sure that it feels unique to them and they bring their own character to it. But I do have my go-tos of what I know looks really good. So a lot of times the first time these moments happened, like the one on the right, um, this was the first time I had a bride like put on her shoe like that. And when I got the photo back, it was in post when I, cause I, I take a lot, I'm a film shooter, but I shoot a lot. So in the like maybe five, six frames of like this single moment of her putting the shoe on, uh, I loved this one the most. And I kind of did a little bit of analysis of why did I love this one so much? What What's different about this photo than one where like maybe one of her hands is up or her foot's at a different angle. And I realized I loved the triangular shape that um, her entire body was making with the dress. And then the other triangle that her arms were making as she reached down. And I was like, ooh, that's a great shape and so easy to do. And I'm gonna do this all the time now. Uh, so I have, you'll see shortly, I have like, 5,000 images now of a bride putting on her shoe this exact same way. And each is a little bit different. The hair, I mean, they're all in different positions and they all bring their own personalities to it. But once I realize what works, I do it a lot. And I've had so many planners be like, oh my God, your bride putting on her shoe shot is the most beautiful I've ever received. And I'm like, yeah, I'm good at that. And like, it sounds funny, but like, it's so many other people are just, um, even ones who aren't 100% documentary coverage, they um, don't have these go-to poses um, in the exact same, and again, it's not the exact same thing every time. Like you do wanna change it up a little bit. And I also, um, what I would say with weddings that's so different than commercial work, um, fashion work, is uh, our client is the subject, which like that's super different if you're not doing portraiture for the person sitting in it or a wedding. Um, you're usually the, the model in your shot and the client are two different people. Um, where our model, we have to make happy. Um, they have to like the way they look in the photo. So that's always paramount. Because like all of this composition stuff, lighting, everything we're gonna talk about, doesn't really matter if your client hates the way they look in the photo. Um, like it's just it all gets thrown out if they think they like have a double chin or like look fat or whatever it is. Um, so things of like positioning their arms and knowing like for each 
bride or groom adapting to those little things of like, oh, that's how this person's gonna look best, um, is really good to have in your arsenal. Um, so yeah, here we've got um, some more of the, um, more of kind of the Fibonacci spiral uh, ideas and just the, the one on the right, the idea of like trapping you in the image there um, that you can see we've kind of created like this circular um, feel between the two of them uh, and it, everything keeps you inside their space uh, and you kind of, your eye just gets driven right up to their smiles, which is that like moment of connection. Uh, and same with the bride on the left that we've kind of got this spiral shape that brings us into her eye. And that's um, another thing that we really, we like eyes. We like looking at people's eyes. Um, so that's a place we will often end up. We might not start there, but it's often where we end up on our journey through a photo. Um, so you can use these same principles with flat lays uh, of how our eyes travel through it. Um, that the uh, here we're getting uh, we're getting trapped in this space, and it kind of keeps our eye from going off into either of those places. Uh, and here we've got these kind of strong diagonals. Uh, and this keeps us within the frame and balances it. This like, I mean, flat styling is a whole nother topic, but you can see how you can use these same um, kind of leading lines uh, to keep your eye engaged and trapped. Um, yeah, so this, um, one of the things that I'm told with flat lays all the time is like you're photographing really pretty paper. Of course, it's pretty. Um, what happens when I have one piece? Uh, and this is where you can use composition. This is what I call like the anti-plop. Um, you never want to plop something down. We're artists. We want to add to whatever we're shooting. So if we're shooting a save the date and you just put it down on a like surface or a counter or whatever, um, all your Yes, you're documenting it, but and it's different, a little different if you're video. But for photo, they they know what their invite looks like. They like they know what this piece of paper or their shoe or whatever looks like. We as artists want to have an opinion on it and create something new with it, because otherwise, like, well, they should just stick their invite into their wedding album or photocopy it or have the PDF proof. What we're doing is creating our own art. So. Uh, like for this one on the left, for the save the date, I've added the rings and I've um, shot it. It was a Malibu wedding. It was like beach meets garden. Uh, so I wanted that to be in the colors of it. Uh, same with the one on the right. Uh, the It was at this beautiful hotel in Newport and I've got the vintage key from there in it along with the florals and the palette from the wedding day. So I'm really putting in more of the color and the narrative of what you're gonna see later in the wedding day. Uh, and this is something that I then became known for as part of my art and um, I, I feel like most of my clients are hiring me more for portraits and moments, but I definitely have some that hire me for this as well, um, especially planners as they're recommending um, and designers. And anytime you can have something that you do uniquely different than anyone else, that's how you create that space and define your voice and set yourself apart from different people, which is um, how you rise in the market. Um, and this the same kind of composition. You can see how uh, everything is leading you. Um, you're stuck in this kind of this little V and everything brings you back. Um, and here I've kind of created these lines that lead you in and keep you trapped. Um, same with uh, the shoes, uh, bridal accessories, flat lay. This is another thing that I love to do. And Again, like I said, you don't want to just plop things down, uh, and it's we're keeping it inside. Even when I'm creating a circular shape, I still want the strong leading line diagonals that keep us in. Uh, and then that S shape with the shoe, I'm going to talk about, yep, there it is. Uh, so the one, most of us like should be able to look at this and feel that the one on the right is stronger than the one on the left, uh, but might not be able to say why. Uh, and that's like all these compositional tools, what I'm hoping we all walk away with is the ability to say why one thing is better than another. And art is subjective 100%, so there's not always like a good and a bad, but there's always a more compositionally successful. Uh, and in this one on the left, we've created, um, we've created this kind of sharp angle um, 
that uh, makes that shoe kind of feel like it's falling into the other one and it's hard. We've got this trapped empty space right here that makes it really hard for our eye to get from that top shoe to the bottom shoe. Uh, and it, we can get, when we go back to the full of it, our eye just gets trapped there and it's hard to bring our eye down to the rest of the frame. In the one on the right, uh, you've got this really nice S shape, which our eyes love S shapes. Um, you'll see this um, more later uh, when I'm posing a bride, a bridesmaid, like always kind of, it's like the Jessica Rabbit, like S shape, like our eyes just love that. Um, so I will pose brides like that and I will pose shoes like that uh, because it just makes a really easy path for our eye to get from one to the other. Um, the reason they are small here is this is the thumbnail rule. Um, if you guys haven't played around with the thumbnail rule, it is one of our strongest tools to check if your composition is good. If something looks good small, it's going to look good big because when you make it small, you're decontextualizing it a little bit. You're getting away from like, ooh, like pretty shoes and pretty purse or whatever it is and making it more about the shape. So oftentimes when I'm teaching someone like basic composition, especially with the flat lay, I'm like, don't even play with invites or shoes, like play with like, blocks, play with like cutouts of paper and just kind of get the shapes down of like how your eye travels between it. Uh, so we'll talk more about the thumb thumbnail rule, but if it looks good small, it's going to look good big. Um, same, uh, another example of using the triangle um, with a bride and groom, and I will show you in a minute of how I kind of do this over and over and over again. Um, so here's triangle overlays with all of these. So you can see it's so many different kinds of images that you can do this with. And a lot of them, I'm not posing this way. It's, I mean, some of them I am, like um, the one I just showed you, oops, wrong way. Uh, the one I just showed you, this one, like I particularly posed it that way to get the triangle. Um, this one I posed that way. But the rest, it's looking for the decisive moment, which we'll talk about more in a sec. Um, but it's that pinnacle of action. And a lot of times it's in editing that you find it. So um, it's kind of weird to like have someone like freeze, like the bride, uh, the maid of honor and the flower girl was her daughter. Um, I told her to squat down so they were at like the same angle and like give her a hug, but I didn't, um, I didn't like say like freeze right there because it would have changed the action, changed the whole mood. It I took seven or eight frames probably of this and it was in post that I found the one that they created this perfect little like pyramid shape. Um, so it's looking to identify that. Uh, so these same triangles and movement and flow can be used in uh, group portraits, which I know is one of the hardest things for people to pose and can feel super intimidating. And it's actually super easy. And it all like, all of these tools, like uh, people call the Annie Leibovitz photo all the time. They're like, oh, I want the Vanity Fair. I feel like that's what bride and grooms tell me all the time. I want the Vanity Fair photo. Uh, and I'm like, cool, yeah, it's the Nicholas Poussin photo. Um, but people don't know who Poussin is. Um, but he, and he didn't invent this at all. Like, again, this is things that like our brain has known forever. But I, Poussin was the first to really get me to understand it uh, when I was uh, doing my junior year in Paris and I would just sit in the Louvre for hours and hours uh, studying his gigantic paintings, um, which were like the size of this wall was the first time I really understood um, that in chaos, like these images on the top, the reason I didn't feel chaotic or frenzied looking at them was because of the use of pyramids uh, and triangles. And there was a very particular way that Poussin wanted me to look at his image. And 600 years after he painted it, I can still look at this image and look at it the way he intended me to because of the composition. And that composition is what we're all using. It's what Annie Leibovitz does very well. Um, so in this Vanity Fair photo on the bottom, uh, you can kind of see the similar like peaks and valleys. And uh, one of the best ways to do this is smaller groupings of people or objects, whatever you've got in there, uh, and the different heights uh, and making sure that there's connection between all the different levels and you're not trapping the eye somewhere, um, which like I know this all kind of sounds vague, so I'll show you what it actually means. Uh, so in, there we go. Um, so in this, I like to pose on three levels, um, are like we've used three a bunch of times, rule of thirds, the golden triangles, we like, we like threes. Uh, our eye just likes looking at things on three levels. Um, it uh, doesn't, when we have 
two of anything, our eye likes to find balance. So we're going to kind of look right in between. Uh, and if we only have two of something, that's usually empty space. So you're leading your viewer to nothing. Whereas if you have three of things, you're leading your viewer to the middle and something's there. Um, so I like to do things on three levels usually. Uh, so I'm gonna get rid of the red lines just for a second so you can see the images better. Uh, in these two, I have um, three levels of the ground, sitting and standing. Same here, we've got ground, sitting, standing. Uh, if you don't have chairs, uh, you can still create dynamic feeling group portraits like this by turning people in towards each other. I kind of like I, I call it the prom photo where it's like all the bridesmaids on one side and all the groomsmen on the other side. And that's a photo I will never take like ever. I think I took it at two weddings when I was just starting and I was like, I don't like this and stopped. Um, I always will mix up the men and women and I often will have like two women standing next to each other turned in towards each other, um, posing the guys in a certain way with everyone around it and it's these little subgroupings just like we saw in the Annie Leibovitz photo that create the visual interest. Um, and then I'm just looking at the triangle shapes and this like it sounds like a lot and when you have um, a group of like especially a huge wedding party um, it can be really intimidating to be like how like where do I even begin like that's the question I get asked a lot with these is where do I even begin and the question is you just got to begin. You got to th start throwing people in there. Uh, Lindsay and Cherish um, were with me um, on a big wedding um, like a month ago now um, that we did for a bachelor couple. And um, that photo has gotten shared a bunch. And I've gotten so many messages of like, how do you begin to pose this? And the answer is you just begin. Like we, ha we had less, we had like an hour to shoot everything that we needed to get done that day. So I did not have a half an hour plus to pose this photo. I think I, we had like six minutes maybe. Uh, and you just start throwing people in and then it's having all of this in your gray matter, in your brain that you already know because you've practiced a bunch of times, you've stared at images for so long and you just, you don't like I don't like literally stand there and draw the triangles over them my brain at this point like that's where I say it's like the cognitive behavior cognitive behavioral therapy part of it my brain is just like oh that feels wrong um, just the way like using improper grammar probably feels wrong to you because you've been speaking for all your life like you need to internalize the visual language in the same way to say like that feels wrong and how you get there is practice like wedding days are the big game uh, everything else is practice on a wedding day you're not running plays in your head or I'm, I don't do sports so I'm probably gonna mess up this metaphor but uh, on what on game days you're not practicing new techniques you're implementing muscle memory and that's what weddings should be they should be a hundred percent or like any job that you're getting paid for really it should be a hundred percent muscle memory you should already know what you're doing uh, so when I look at something like this, I can identify um, that there's, like I pulled her veil out. So, oops, wrong way. Uh, I pulled her veil out, so I have this nice little triangle shape that I'm creating there. I have another pyramid here, another pyramid here, and these subgroupings. And like I think originally this girl here was a little bit closer in, and I realized these two guys here just felt like too much on their own. And just by giving that little bit of space, I created an extra little triangle in there. And it's like those like games you play as a kid where it's like, how many triangles are in this photo? The more triangles, the better. Like our eyes really love them. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure that every little subgrouping felt really resolved. Uh, so again, when I started this, I did not know how it was going to turn out. And I just throw people in there and then I move them around. And that's fine. Like you don't, you don't want to ever come across to your client as like, you don't know what you're doing. Um, but and you all have to like, it's, again, I say define your voice. You have to define um, your personality too with your clients. And I joke around with them. I'm pretty casual, even at very formal affairs. Um, I just, 99% of our job is before we click the shutter. It's making the person in front of us feel comfortable. And I always wanna try to stay um, myself. Uh, I think the more vulnerable we can be, the more vulnerable people will be in front of us. Um, so I will just be like, nope, I can't tell you where to be. Like, just get in there, just sit down, like do your thing and then I'll move you. Like, that's how I communicate it. That might not be your style of communication, um, but you do, you wanna make it clear that you do know what you're doing to your client, to your client. Um, the other way I will use triangles in group photos um, is ones like this up here of the bride um, kind of spreading, spreading out the dress. Like just, I always am looking for 
ways to create these shapes no matter what the photo is and just like the ones I showed you before with like the go-to thing um, this happened organically at a wedding like six years ago and I was like ooh, like that makes a nice triangle and now I have I do this photo all the time and I don't like particularly like tell them like oh get here and like freeze here I just say like and I don't even let them like cotton on to what I'm doing I'm just like oh guys can you like I'm gonna take a bridal portrait of her can you all help with her dress and I'm like oh the ones in the back like can you grab her veil so that makes them stand up and oh like girls in the front can you straighten her hem like at her shoe and that makes them go down a level so I'm not like make a make a pyramid make a triangle it's like these little subtle directions um, that Get that shape. Did I just mess up my mic? Am I okay? Okay, perfect. Sorry, thought I got caught. Um, so here's uh, a bunch of different examples of what I mean of doing this again and again and again. And you're about to see a bunch of these. Um, please don't laugh at me. I do the same stuff all the time. And you can see how all of these do feel a little bit different. And they all bring in the bride's personality a little bit. Like I love, um, this was from like a big five day wedding in France. Um, and this bride was just like so, so funny and laughing the whole time. And like as they were doing it, she was falling in the grass um, so that isn't maybe the perfect triangle shape that some of the other ones are, but it's still a great image. Um, and that's also like, I wanna make sure is very clear because I get asked this a lot when I'm talking about the decisive moment and like getting this pinnacle of action. That doesn't mean I'm not gonna take a great moment or a photo if it's not that perfect composition because like these are our <laughs> clients' memories and they're important. Uh, it's just that when we can get these perfect moments, um, our eyes like to look at them. Um, so here's more of the shoe that I was talking about. I've got that first photo that I did it with. Um, and then you can see like they're all, they feel slightly different, um, but they're all like there's, they've got both shoes on in all of it. Um, Cause I think the barefoot always looks weird. Um, they're always kind of got their arms in this like long lean way that um, makes them look nice. Um, no one's like squishing their arm down and like getting the arm fat look no bride likes. Um, I've got the close-up version of it here as well. Um, and you can see the slight variations in how I do it, that if a shoe is gonna look better from its side, um, like those cool blue, those um, blue Paul Walker, uh, or not Paul, at least Walker, Walker, not Paul Walker. Um, I forget the name of the brand. Um, but those were for a very long time, like one of my most pinned, probably still is, most pinned, most Instagram photo. Uh, and if it was shot straight on, kind of like the, how the Valentinos are here, you wouldn't really, you just see the top of her foot. You wouldn't see any of that blue detailing. So that's where like you adapt to the situation. Um, every, everything that you photograph has a Face, whether it's like an actual literal like bride or groom's face that you're trying to flatter or a shoe or a bouquet or a reception room. Everything has an angle and a face that will show it off to its best. Um, so I'm always looking for that like slight difference um, while doing these on repeat. Um, same of the bride putting her earring in. You can see how like they're all a little bit different. Um, like one's got the mom in it, but it's still always, and I never want to interrupt. Like her mom was helping her put in her earring and I never want to interrupt what could be a natural moment. Um, but like, I'm, you know, I'm standing back here photographing it and I'm like, and she's doing it maybe with one hand and I'm like, oh, you know what? Can you just bring your other hand up to it for a sec to like move it around just so I can see it through my camera, which like I'm not seeing the earring through my camera. I just want her to do this because that's a flattering shape. Um, so little directions we can give. Um, groom buttoning um, his tux and playing with his cufflink and playing with his watch, something that I take thousands and thousands of times um, in these very similar ways. Um, I hate the like weird, awkward, like Batman half putting the jacket on photo. Like the guys just like, they don't look good in that. Um, this looks much more flattering. Um, and I can say like for, if you're selling to brides and grooms, for the most part, it's usually the bride hiring us or a planner uh, or a parent. And I feel like when I can win over a groom, like I'm probably gonna book that client because what when the groom usually does get involved is like the bride will show him a few photos and be like, what do you like? Do you like how she photographs guys? And they'll be like, yeah, or no. Um, I feel like that's mean to guys, sorry. Um, my guy impression's not very good. Um, but it's, it's that simple of like, yeah, I like the way she photograph or he photographs guys um, or like no the guys look stiff and unhappy and bored so being able to photograph guys well um, and make them look debonair and sharp versus like stiff and unhappy um, which is how a lot of grooms look when you're photographing them um, is a good skill 
Um, so here I've got the like showing off the back of the dress photo um, that I kind of already showed um, that one with like the triangle shape uh, and you can see the variations of like how I've done it multiple times on a staircase or flat um, but it's pulling out the train um, and you can do it like you do it with two guys you can do it with two girls um, I mean the guy won't have the train but the same shape that like I'm creating over and over again um, it's one of my go-to poses um, okay um, so um, now we're gonna talk about uh, moving along with composition, we're going to talk about uh, what I call like the circle and the square. Uh, all everything we've just seen are shapes that our eyes like to travel on. It's all the movement, flow, and focus. There's a journey. There's a path. There's an end. Um, what happens when we have just a big old circle in the middle of our frame is there's nowhere to go. Um, our eye enters it and then we leave it because we just we bounce out really quickly. We get bored. A triangle. We have sharp edges. We have places to go. Um, we have get stuck in a circle. We look at it we leave. Uh, so um, a lot of times we're photographing circular things and the question is like, what do we do with it then? Uh, and we break it up or we add more. Uh, so in this one on the left, um, this bouquet like had a very circular feel to it. And when I was shooting the entire thing, um, it felt there was all this empty space to the right of the frame. Uh, and it just, it it felt so unbalanced because there was so much on the left and then nothing on the right. By cutting it off there, I've now instead created that triangle within the circle shape uh, and in the one on the right, instead of just having the one lone circle that we look at and bounce out of, by having two circles, I've now created a diagonal, uh, which helps us create a triangle, which I've established we all like to look at. Um, and everything in this image on the right is trapping us in this image. You can see how like there's really this triangular shape being created here with this sprig and um, this flower. And this fork here keeps our eye from leaving the frame. This fork here juts our eye upwards. Like everything is keeping us within there, which gives us the journey versus the single like dot that we just leave the frame super quickly when we look at. Um, so that is always our goal. And I was not thinking about any of that when I took either of these images, by the way. Like this is all, like I know it sounds like people get like so overwhelmed and they're like, oh my God, how am I ever gonna pick a camera up again and like have all this in my brain? And it's, it's again, it's language. Like you don't, as I'm talking right now, I'm not thinking of every letter. I'm not thinking of grammar. I just know it. And that's what you can do when you, study these techniques, when you look at them, when you study your own photos and figure out, and what you like might be different than what I like, and that's totally fine. Uh, but by understanding that, we get to shoot with more intention, and this just will become second nature and super easy. The one on the right here, like this was 2014, 2015, I think I took it, way before I was teaching flat lays, uh, or thinking about the breakdown of how I do them, because it wasn't until I started teaching them that I really broke it down into like, why do I do things the way I do them? Um, and I just was like, okay, two plates and like throw in some sprigs and I moved them around while I was looking through my camera until the thumbnail looked right and I took the photo. Uh, and that was one of my first to win, uh, whoop, to win a big rangefinder award. Um, and it was funny actually when I won, I was like, huh, that's like an interesting image that they chose. Uh, I was a little surprised. I was like, I like it, why do they? And then I analyzed it um, and kind of took it from there. But we want to make sure that we're always shooting with that intention. Um, more circles uh, and diagonals, um, just to reinforce that uh, one more time, that two circles our eyes tend to like a lot more. Um, so the next tool that we'll move on to is cropping and framing. Um, our eyes, while we liked the cropping, I'd like this, I know some, it might sound confusing, while we liked the cropping in the last one of the bouquet, uh, the cropping in this one feels uncomfortable. I don't know like how many of you look at this and cringe. Um, and what's fun about um, visual language is once you see things, you can never unsee things. Um, so like I love when I teach this and then everyone like will message me after and they're like, you ruined me forever. Like I can't look at Instagram without cringing now. And I'm like, you're welcome. Um, because you just can't unsee things once you see them. Um, so 
in an image like this one, I would either crop it like right there at the base of her dress or you show the full like drama of that dress. By cropping it here, it's neither here nor there. It's like this weird in between that it feels like it was a mistake. Like there's no visual harmony in there. You get dragged down to there and here like there is like that's a lot of visual weight on the bottom but they're like giving so much attitude that like it's a nice counterbalance where here because like this feels so like just distracting to me and unbalanced my eye gets trapped down there and it's actually really hard for my eye to get back to them who are the focus of this image uh, so you want to be really careful where you're choosing to crop things um, when you're framing it uh, same here, like this, like, like it's like nails on a chalkboard to me when I look at something like that, like just that little bit of edge just cut off right there feels so uncomfortable to me. And it also doesn't feel balanced. Like when we're talking about rule of thirds and those golden triangles, like here you've got these nice leading lines that are kind of both bringing you to the center of the image where here, like the most interesting part of this image is this bottom piece. And it's all like really in the lower third. Um, and bringing our eye kind of to the dead center space um, instead of like the nice top of the flowers there. Uh, and that bottom corner just traps my eye um, and I, I can't get away from it. Um. Uh, when you're looking at uh, framing things, you want to always think about your background. Um, the This is the same image, and I photoshopped it, um, and it uh, took forever um, and was annoying, so now I am more cognizant of it, and I'm very careful um, when I want a clean background to make sure I actually have that clean background, because in this one on the right, where you've got half the clean background, and then it was a white wall, uh, and then the rest of the room was blue, um, and I wasn't really paying attention to what that background looked like and when I got it back I was like oh this is such a beautiful image of the bouquet I just hate how unbalanced it feels and when I filled it in so it looked like it was just against the white wall it felt so much more harmonious um, and just like clean and simple whereas like my eye keeps getting dragged to here which is the least interesting part of this image I don't want the eye in this weird dark spot to the side of her arm um, you can also use uh, different uh, frame, like actual frames um, in uh, addition to the way we crop things uh, or our background choices uh, to show the eye where we want it to go. Um, these um, are both, this was a villa in Italy that had a ton of arches, so it was very fun to stick my couple in a lot of the different arches. Um, but you can see how, um, do I have the triangles here? No. I'll show them later. Um, okay, so we have this kind of archy shape here, and then she's creating a triangle within it. Here we have one arch and two, and you can see how just like that little bit of his like leg pointed out a little, and I took the ribbons and kind of pulled them a bit, create this triangle inside. So like everything is bringing us back into where I want you to look. Um, okay, angles and point of view. Um, so. Another tool that we can use at our disposal when I just showed like that bouquet shot, um, all like I said that everything has a face, a bouquet has its face and that's important, but we also want to think about how we're using it within the overall composition of the image. In this one on the right, um, the bouquet, it's kind of hard to tell that it's a bouquet. It kind of feels a little bit more like a blob of flowers because it's being kind of stuck out like this instead of like this. Uh, and like, yes, you get to see all the like the tops of the flowers, which are usually the prettiest part, but it ends up feeling like this weird ball in the middle of the image, like I talked before with like that circle, and there's not a ton for us to look at. It's also unbalanced where the bridesmaid is kind of standing to the or that side of the image with the bouquet, and then we've got like this weird empty space here that just doesn't feel um, as, um, as resolved. Um, whereas this one, when I have her kind of taking up the full space in the frame uh, and have her with the, you can see, you don't want to see too many stems because again, that's not the prettiest part of the bouquet, uh, but having some of it showing that identifies like this is a bouquet with architecture and shape uh, and having like, I this is very purposefully cropped and composed to create kind of this diamond shape here that's keeping you engaged inside of it. 
Um, the other thing to be thinking about constantly is point of view, especially when photographing kids. This is another like huge seller that I think, um, like when I say like, if you can photograph a groom well, that's a good selling point. If you can photograph kids well, that's a huge selling point because um, it's not something that everyone will pay attention to. Uh, and one of the most important things with kids is getting down on their level. Same with dogs um, or like, flowers that you're photographing on the ground, um, changing your perspective can make a huge difference. Um, so an image like the one on the left, which um, I was like lying on the ground, like sitting with all of them, and I'm on her level, um, which like, A, like made her laugh, uh, and B, got this, it, it's showing the kid with respect. It's showing her in, uh, I mean, she's in great light, but it's the light that I'm showing her in, not just actual lighting, um, but the my perspective on her um, is so much nicer than in the one on the right where I'm shooting down on her. It's a weird angle. Um, it's making you as the viewer feel like she's lesser than, um, and it's not giving that same like reverence to the subject. Um, so just, thinking about how you're changing. Like, yes, they're creating a bit of a triangle, like her and that dog, uh, but it's a whole different vibe to that photo. So you wanna think about how your perspective um, and your actual point of view uh, is changing the way, what you're saying about your subject. Um, and there's not always a right and wrong. Um, in the one on the left, I'm shooting her straight on. In the one on the right, I'm shooting down on her a little bit. So, uh, and I like both of these images. Um, there's not always a right and wrong. You just wanna think about what, in the one on the right, I'm really, I'm showing off her earring more. I'm showing off the veil. Um, she had the kind of like fun, like vintage vibe happening um, with the veil really sitting on the top of her head, which you don't see as often anymore. So I wanted to make sure I got a perspective of that. Um, so just, again, it's all about intention. It's what, what are you trying to show and why. Um, again, with the shoes, um, the Valentino example and the flowers, um, the rock studs look best from the front because that's where uh, the detail in the shoe is, where these others, you kind of want to show the side of it off because that's where the detail is. So always identifying that face. Um, okay, so more on the thumbnail rule that we talked about briefly before. Um, this is basically the idea, if something looks good big, it's gonna look good small. Uh, and what's really nice uh, about Lightroom is you can make your images small and look at them. So if you're kind of trying to decide between three or four similar images, make them small. And I will literally like scooch back from my desk and kind of like squint at them. Because the more you squint, the more you decontextualize them and make them about those shapes. Um, so basically, I mean, these are all just random images, but you can see how I mean, they look hopefully pretty small to you from there, um, that all of them feel like strong compositions. Um, and that's like, hopefully you can pull any photo from uh, my Instagram, my website. And this, like when I was studying this in school, um, Instagram didn't exist, like Facebook was like the cool thing, um, but I don't think we even had it on our, I didn't have an iPhone, like cell phones weren't a thing that you could like get the internet on really. Um, so we were looking at images much bigger. These days we are almost exclusively looking at images small. So it is even more important to nail your thumbnail and make sure that it is strong because someone is just scrolling past it so quickly and probably only looking at it small. It's pretty rare that someone, especially like maybe a parent would go on a computer, but it's pretty rare that a bride or a groom, if they're like under 40, would look at your work on a computer versus their cell phone. Um, okay, so a few uh, language words that are helpful uh, as you're thinking about everything we've just talked about. Um, and these are from Roland Barthes, um, who is a wonderful writer on photography. Uh, and he's um, defined the operator, the spectator, and the spectrum. Um, the operator is us, the photographer. The um, spectator is the person looking at the photo. So in this case, like I'm the operator, you guys are the spectators. And then the spectrum is the subject or the target of the photograph. And these are just great words to have in the back of your mind as as you're thinking about everything we've just talked about and how you want to shoot with intention. Um, you want to think about what your uh, view is as the operator. You want to think of um, what, how someone's going to interpret it as the spectator without your caption and what you're saying about the spectrum, the subject of your photograph. Um, so here, I'm the operator, I've taken this. Um, you guys are the spectators, you're looking at it, bride and groom or spectrum. Everyone following? Perfect. 
Um, so the other two words that I want to give you from Roland Barthes, and this all comes from Camera Lucida, and I'll have a slide at the end that says that, uh, are the studium and the punctum. Um, basically, the studium is the denotation, and the punctum is the connotation. So with a studium, every photograph has one. Uh, it's the denotation of the image. It refers to the building block elements evident in the image. It can be interpreted differently because of our different backgrounds, cultures, and gray matter, but these are facts, not feelings. The punctum, um, as defined by Bartz, is the accident which pricks me and bruises me. It's the connotation. It can live alongside the studium, but not every photograph has one, and it can be deeply personal. Uh, some photos may have punctums for some and not for others, and it turns an image we like into an image we love. This is our job by, uh, this is our our job as photographers, especially wedding photographers, we're hired by our clients to document their most important memories, and we want to deliver photos full of punctum for them. And luckily, like love is a very universal feeling. So if it's the more uh, personal we get for our clients, the more universal it's actually looked at and loved. Um, so um, yeah, it's a weird word, but I will say it to my clients all the time. They're like, I want punctum me. I'll make it into an adjective. Um, punctum me images for you guys. Um, it means something really that they're connecting to and loving. So to go back to this. This image, like the studium, is it's a bride and groom. That's what it is. It's a fact. Um, pretty simple. The punctum for me, like I, I love this image, so it has punctum for me. And it's the connection between the bride and groom. It's how they're looking at each other. Uh, it's like this nice little V shape that they're creating uh, and that little unique connection. Uh, and I love it feels to me like someone just, um, this is how I describe my images all the time, that I want this like cinematic feel that someone just pressed pause on the movie at the exact perfect image where it feels like you guys, but it also, you also look perfect. It's like reality TV where it's real but you still look perfect um, so I love like the bend whoop, the bend in his leg um, and the movement that you can feel in the dress that it feels like they're coming at you and it feels alive um, but the leg doesn't feel broken or awkward um, it's they both look good in it um, so the question that I want you guys to constantly ask yourselves uh, about anything you're doing using all of the tools that we've just talked about is why and this is where intention comes in. So why this lighting? Why this pose? Why this composition? Um, and then it's the what. So what do all of those things say about my subject? So like, I uh, like what am I as the operator saying about my spectrum? Um, because all of these things do change. Like just as I was showing you guys with the point of view on like with little kids, it really changes the feeling of that photo. So like you know, if we're, are we trying to make this child look large and big and, um, or are we trying to make them look kind of small and demure? Um, so um, I'm gonna start with why this pose. Um, and this is kind of a fun project I did a couple years ago uh, of using, um, mistakes is the wrong word, but using like, um, not as successful um, things that I was seeing every day on Instagram, on big wedding websites um, that just the couple weren't feeling as connected um, and as um, resolved as they could be. And a lot of it came down to body language. Um, so this is a little bit away from composition for a second and really thinking um, about how to make your couple um, look like they like each other, honestly. Um, so uh, in this one on most of these images, the one on the left is, or I think all of these, it should be, the one on the left is the like common mistakes that I see, and the one on the right is how to correct it. Um, so this is what I call like posing flow mistake. Uh, and that's like most of us will start um, for those of you who shoot weddings with like the bride and groom smiling at us, looking at each other, like standing right next to each other, like bouquet, like all good. If it's the engagements, they're like still like standing there smiling. And then we're like, okay, now turn into each other. And what always happens is they're both standing there going like this and they go, okay, and turn like that. Um, like that looks so weird. Your feet are pointed towards like, that. That's where you can see. That's where you guys as the um, spectator can see me as the operator in the photo. And I do not want that. You Like I should be invisible and this should feel like this nice little intimate moment of them. Where in this image, like her pelvis is completely turned out, which is not as attractive. It makes her look whiter. Um, and he just looks ridiculous. Like he looks like he doesn't really like her. Um, where in this one on the right, when he's actually, and I say this to grooms, 
all the time, like, nope, pick up your feet, point them towards her, like you like her, which then makes them laugh. Um, so again, like that's where you find your language with your couples. Um, I like to tease mine a little bit, um, but we're creating this nice triangle shape and they really feel connected. It feels like an authentic moment instead of one that I've contrived. And of course I've completely contrived this, but it doesn't feel that way. Uh, and that's what we should always be striving for. Um, in this one, um, again, this one on the left is something I see all the time. Like, yes, they're looking at each other. Yes, they're turned in towards each other. Um, but there's no interaction. Like, they, again, don't really look like they like each other very much. Like, yes, they're smiling. Uh, but there's no there's no tension, which we'll talk about in a minute. And there's just, there's no connection. Where in this other one, I've had her wrap her back arm up around his neck and it's kind of playing with his hair, um, which that's where, like, I really like to watch my couples a little bit and see like how do they naturally interact with it naturally interact with each other um does she like to put her arm on his chest on um, shoulder whatever it is and then i ask them to do that and that's how you make sure the image still feels uniquely like them um and i love this one because even in the one on the right the dog knows that it's a better photo he's smiling um so that's why he circles um dog's like yep yeah, my parents look good um so um <laughs> i call this one the serial killer um the one on the left and like Seriously, look at Style Me Pretty. You will see 5,000 of these, like from lots of great photographers. Um, and it's just thinking that's, so these photos all come from a series I did called More Than Pretty Tones, um, which is what some of this lecture is from. And what I see all the time, especially from film shooters, is so much focus on getting pretty colors, on pretty tones, on these pretty compositions without thinking deeper about their images. And that's what like, I'm on a crusade to stop. Like you've got to think deeper. You've got to think about body language. You've got to make sure your couples look like they like each other and not like he's about to murder her because that's a creepy image. Um, and that happens all the time because again, posing flow, what happens is you've got like the guy above, he's like circling around her. Um, they're both looking at you and smiling and it's kind of like that promy photo. A lot of times this is like, I'll take for like the New York Times photo if they need, because it's like that weird um, eyeball to eyeball thing that the New York Times wants because they crop it so tight. Um, and I call it the giant floating head photo um, and that's usually the only way to get it if the guy is so much taller he's kind of got to like lean over um, but I like to use that opportunity to move into this photo on the right which is actually a very sweet um, one where I'm like okay like now we've got that out of the way like now like nuzzle her or snuggle her or whatever you know your word is going to be um, and what happens is like the girl looks down and laughs and the guy is like am I doing it am I doing it and like it's looking up at you and like it looks like he's going to murder her. Um, it's not a good look. Um, same here, like don't kiss with your eyes open. Um, and that includes forehead kissing. Um, it's not something that like most of you would probably not kiss the person you love with your eyes open. Um, Cause it's weird and it's creepy and it looks it. And that's something that I have seen a million times and you guys all, I promise like it's super fun now. I've ruined you all for Instagram. You're gonna be like, oh, every time you see this now. But he like, she's enjoying herself and he looks like so bored. Um, like he looks like I told him to do that and he wants to get out of there, which is the truth. Um, but in the one on the right, just the difference of his eyes closed, now he looks like he's into it too. We always want that. Both of them, mutual affection. Um, so here, um, this is a shot a ton of us will do, especially us who manually focus our cameras. Uh, it's very nice to have people like walk on the same plane of focus versus walking towards you because then you're like walking backwards, um, which I do as well. But with this, um, with the girl in front, um, you either get what I call um, the evolution of man photo, where the girl has like got really good um, posture and the guy is like bent over like the ape in the evolution of man photo, and it looks like he like she's evolving from him. Um, or if you try to correct that, the guys overcorrect and look like they have a stick up their butt, which like look how ramrod straight his spine is. It's very awkward. Where when you have the guy in front instead all of a sudden, like, it just seems so much more natural. Um, he's got, his body is open a little bit more towards the camera. He's walking in a way that feels comfortable. Um, and in the one in the, on the left, like, she kind of feels like she's prancing in front of him a little bit. The one on the right, it just feels more comfortable. And especially on a wedding day, when you have a wedding dress, like, you're gonna default into this anyway, because the wedding dress is probably gonna have a train. And if you have the girl in front, the guy's just gonna trip. Um, with picking up photos, something we do all the time. The one on the left, um, and this is something I see all the time um, with guys like thrusting their hips forward to kind of hold them. She weighs like 90 pounds, she's nothing. Like he does not need to be like struggling under her weight. But in the one on the left, it looks like he is. It looks like he's struggling under her weight. Uh, and it's not an attractive look of like his stomach. It's not an attractive look of her um, 
bottom side, um, where the one on the right just, I'm like, okay, now like straighten out. And just by that, he's not like leaning forward with her, just went back to like normal spine position. And it's so much more attractive in the one on the right. Um, so this is now a few examples. Um, those were all taken specifically to show common pitfalls. These are examples of like just posing flow and making the decision in post. Where this one on the left, like I was just posing them, trying out different things, and I was like, oh, like look on the ground. Uh, and then I was like, okay, and now turn and look into each other. And when I got it, when I got my scans back, I was like, is she looking at a bug? And like, why is he smiling? Why does she not care that he's smiling? Like what, like try to caption it. That's like my favorite rule, is try like anything you're doing, no matter what the photo is. If you can't caption it, you probably shouldn't be taking it. You probably shouldn't be including it in your final edit. Uh, we're in the one on the right, we've got this nice pyramid shape, we've got like a heart that they're creating with their heads to their hand, and they're just engaged. It's that trapping them in the image feel, and it's a really nice, sweet moment. Um, okay, um, well, I have to take a little sip of water, sorry guys. <clears throat> okay, so one of the other questions I want you guys to ask is why this light? Um, so when I'm doing, um, usually I like to use natural light, but into the evening, um, sun sets at weddings and we need to know what to do when that happens. Um, so most of us will probably have to play with artificial light a little bit. Uh, so deciding in advance what you want that image to look like is going to be pretty important to the outcome of it. Uh, and the one on the left, I knew I really wanted the tent lit up um, and to have some of the stars, but to still have like this kind of bluish glow. So taking it like right at like, in, like 45 minutes or so after sunset, I knew that I was gonna get that nice balance where if I had waited two hours and it was like 10 o'clock at night, I'd have the stars, but I wouldn't have that bluish glow. It'd be too black. Um, so pre-visualizing what you want your image to look like can be very helpful. Um, in the one on the right, um, this was a beautiful um, dark um, crypt in Italy, and it felt like Beauty and the Beast. Um, and like the bride loved that and wanted the like that beautiful ambient glow of the candles. So if I had taken it like this one on the left. Um, which is super dark in the background, it really changes the vibe of, of the photo not having as much of the atmosphere in it. So you want to choose your lighting technique. Like these are both lit with two video lights and a tripod on film, uh, but they're different um, intentions where the one on the left, I didn't want you to see so much ambient because it was a really busy room. So by having less ambient light, um, I was able to achieve that. Um, same here, uh, I'm balancing an artificial light um, with very little natural light at night and I didn't want um, to, I wanted a little bit of this background lit up. Um, so I had to make sure this is shot on a tripod because like this lighting was probably like a quarter of a second, I'd say. So if you are shooting your ambient at a quarter of a second, you know, you have to balance your artificial, otherwise you're gonna cancel out your ambient, um, which I'm not, I'm gonna run out of time if I get too much into lighting. Um, but if we have time later, I can explain that more. But Google um, lighting balance, like basically our eyes can't take in more than two stops of light, uh, or our eyes can, cameras can't. Um, so you wanna make sure you're always balancing taking your ambient reading and balancing your artificial with it. Um, when I'm doing um, receptions, um, I like to have a lot of ambient light in the background. Um, for me, it's really important that my images um, don't just convey the way something looked, but how it felt. And I say that all the time. Like I use that as a selling point to my clients, um, which I, again, like back to like being in the luxury market, if like I'm sure everyone in here probably hates selling themselves. Like if you don't, like awesome, good for you. Like I wish I didn't. Um, so I've tried to make that everything that I use as a sales tactic to be really genuine and true. So instead of like talking about like, I'm awesome and like hire me because of this, I just talk about my work and my approach to it. And that is then what sells me. So I talk about wanting to capture the ephemeral essence. I want you to look back on an image of like you dancing with your father and to remember what it felt like to be on that dance floor. So I like to have a lot of ambient in my images because of that. And there's incredible, I have so many 
friends in the film community who have a totally different style and whose work has a lot of slow flash in it or has a lot of drop off where like the couple are lit but everything behind it is black and that's not my style but I totally respect it and think it's really cool it's just different than how I want my photos to look so that's where like learn these like learn lighting learn techniques and it's not that I mean there's classes everywhere in New York there you can take just Google it, watch on YouTube, it's super easy, and just learn how to balance your light so you can make these decisions intentionally uh, instead of defaulting. Um, okay, so you guys have heard me say the decisive moment a few times now, uh, and this is an Henri Cartier-Bressant image. I will not take credit for this as much as I would like to. Um, uh, this uh, is a pretty famous image of his that kind of um, coined the term and this is getting the pinnacle of action and this is what I'm always looking to do so everything we've kind of talked about so far leads to this decisive moment um, this is one of my favorite examples to use of the decisive moment um, it's a Melvin Salkowski image um, the one on the right is the like final image um, which hangs I'm pretty sure it's at MoMA um, it's a very famous fashion photo of his. Um, it sells for lots and lots of money um, as a print. Uh, the one on the left is an outtake. Uh, and because the one on the right was so successful and they were running out of prints, uh, print runs of it, because it was limited edition print, uh, they decided to release um, the one on the left at a much cheaper price, um, much like, like a hundredth of a price of the one on the right. Um, and I have a print of it hanging in my house um, because I love this series and it's the one I could afford. Um, and I love it as an example as well of this is a quantifiable amount on what the decisive moment can do for you where like this this one is literally a hundred times like quantifiable money more than this one and you can see it's so much more of a successful image that like the her leg feels broken in this one she doesn't feel as elegant the, the jacket isn't lying as nicely where this one she's got this like swan like grace and beauty and like obviously the color is a little different because it was color corrected for this one and not for this one since it was the outtake but it's it's everything is working together in this image and you can I just I love this example because it is the quantifiable that one is better <laughs> um, or worth more money at least um, I spent um, a year working in Richard Avedon's archive scanning this shoot, basically my entire time there. For any of you guys who don't know Richard Avedon, you should Google him. He's amazing. Um, he's one of the most famous uh, fashion photographers of all time. Um, he was the first to get a million dollar contract by Vogue. He's pretty baller. Lots of his stuff hangs at MoMA. Um, passed away many years ago, but um, his work lives on, um, as we all hope ours will. Uh, and what I learned from spending time Time scanning in his archive we were literally digitizing thousands and thousands I'm sure they're still working on it digitizing thousands of negatives uh, and I spent probably like seven months on this one shoot which was Lauren Hutton I think it was 1976 Paris like spring or fall fashion uh, and I would just be scanning rows and rows and rows of uh, medium format film and I would like watch Lauren Hutton like walking towards me and then walking away and then walking towards me and then walking away and then I could see in grease pen what Avedon had circled and then what the editors uh, at Vogue and Bazaar had circled because that's where the images were going um, Alexander Lieberman and Alexei Brodovich um, and it was really interesting to see sometimes it was the same and sometimes it was different and that's where like again there's no artist objective there's not always one right answer um, and it was interesting because then I could actually like pull the magazines because they also had them in the archive and see which one one ended up in there and sometimes it was Avedon's choice and sometimes it was one of the art directors but seeing the micro differences um, I, I don't have access to all of them I just found these online so it could show these um, and these are obviously the finals not the outtakes but when I was scanning like seeing the difference of what was circled and what was chosen of like a leg being like here versus here or here or like in an awkward position or like uh, a hand being here versus like a pinky being out it's these little micro movements and you're like 
oh, that's why he's worth a million dollars. Like, wow, that is attention to detail. And that attention to detail is what makes this art. So when you're looking for that decisive moment, like you have to take those extra frames. Like, yes, you can start to, you don't want to like spray and pray. You Like no one wants to do that, especially if you're a film shooter, you're just going to be broke all the time. Like you want to be able to identify it as you're taking it, but you could miss it. So you do need to always take a few extra frames. Uh, this is um, like one of my better known images um, that's won a few awards. And I completely pre-visualized this. I knew going in exactly what I wanted this image. I spent a year planning this image and knew exactly what I wanted it to look like. And it does. Like I have a very bad um, drawer, but I have really like crude renderings that look like this. Um, and you can see here all of my outtakes. Um, I think I probably shot three rolls um, just of this exact scene of the two of them there. Um, and I think maybe in like one of, one of them, maybe in that one, or this one here, you can, I can't really tell. One of them you can see like the, pla this one here, you can see the planner throwing the bird seed. Um, and some of them she's actually in it. Some of them you can see like the birds are more in front of them. Um, some there's not enough birds at all. Um, some their connection isn't as strong with each other. Uh, I wanted you to be able to see, uh, I didn't want the birds to be a complete blur because I didn't want them to so decontextualized, but I wanted you to see their movement in flight. Um, and I really, like, I had pictured kind of a swirl. And when I saw this one and I saw, you could tell they're pigeons, they're not just totally blurry, but you can see that movement in their wings. Uh, and then this kind of like beautiful, like swooping shape um, that it was creating here. And I just, I loved that little one in the corner. That was one of my favorite details um, of this image. I just knew that that one was so far and beyond the better and like for me this was my looking through Avedon's archive and just looking for like the minutia of like this one being so much better than that one. Uh, and something I say to my clients all the time um, is I care about your images more than you do and I really genuinely feel that the second I stop feeling that way, I should stop shooting weddings. Um, I care about my art so much. Um, like They're going to care about having a happy moment. They're going to care about looking good. I care about this. I care about the art I'm creating so deeply and so passionately that they're not going to notice all of this. Like they're not like, you know, if the pigeons in front of them in one of the images, like they're not, they're still going to love it. They're still going to look at themselves and adore the way they look. Um, so all of this stuff, like, Yes, it's serving your client, but like it should be serving you as an artist. And then again, that's in turn how we bring in the better clients. Um, not better, not better. Sorry, but uh, more the more luxurious level of client. No, no client is better than one or another. Although a mean client is um, not as good. Um, but um, I've had very cheap weddings with clients who I adore, um, and very luxurious weddings whose clients yelled at me. Um, so. Um, uh, tangent. Um, so here are some um, kind of decisive moment shots where I'm showing the one on the right is like my final image of it and the one on the left will be one before or after uh, that just like that little bit of difference makes such a, a difference. Um, so like here you can see um, part of the um, cornhole game behind them um, and the connection between them is nice but so much stronger here and their legs like look goofier here than they do there. Um, here, this like I'm sure we've all done this, um, where like you've thrown the veil and like ran backwards, uh, or had your assistant do it, um, and like this one, like I feel like you can almost like see. It looks like I photoshopped out her fingers. I promise I didn't. It was just like a weird way it was dropped, um, where the swoop of this one is so much nicer. Um, here, like talk about awkward legs, like this is a model, like she should look perfect and both of them look kind of awful here. Like his pants are too short on him, he looks goofy, they don't really look like they like each other. Her leg looks like like awkward and broken there where this one, it's creating this beautiful triangle shape. They like, he's looking adoringly at her, she's looking down at like their rings. Um, her legs look long and lovely. Um, taking those extra shots makes all the difference. Um, the recessional coming down the aisle, like this is such a super cute moment where like you can see he's high-fiving people, but in this one on the right, when he like actually like makes the like fist of like, yeah, and she's laughing. Um, and like her, I mean, even though she's laughing here, like this is so much better. Um, yeah, it's those like, take those extra shutter, like take those extra frames, you'll never regret it and delete them if you do. Um, 
the bride walking across here. Um, like this is a nice image, but so much better with the dress out versus like the awkward way it's slanting back here. Here she's looking straight forward. We're here when she's looking down, it's kind of echoing really beautifully the line of that. Um, here we've got the two of them walking forwards, which is lovely, but now when she turns back and you have this moment of connection, it's so much stronger. Um, both of them walking towards us, um, very similar shot. Both of them are really nice um, and they do have like a nice connection here, but this one on the right, and this is where like, again, I'm talking about flattering your clients is so important. Um, the way the light is hitting her dress really nicely um, is, and I mean, they're both they're both beautiful, but it's a very flattering um, play of highlight and shadow. Um, so just can create a stronger photo. Um, here again with the leg, um, having it kind of, in, like there's nothing wrong with the one on the left, but so much better. You got that Angelina Jolie leg going on the right. Um, here, like this is something where I would deliver both of them, the one on the left, like I think he said something probably pretty inappropriate and she's cracking up. It's funny, it's a cute image for them. The one on the right though, where like you've got this like amazing like wind picking up these um, ribbons and that incredible laugh that she's got, like this was one of my most popular photos on Instagram for a couple years. Um, so it's, we're like this is super cute and it's great for them, but like this is gonna be your hero shot. Um, here, just the difference of moving your head, which is the same as I was talking about before with the image where when I was looking through the camera, I wasn't realizing that this one was better and I was just moving her around to have different options. And when I got the scans back, I realized how much stronger this one was than this one because here you're kind of creating this weird X shape where here you've got this nice kind of triangle happening and the line of her eyes is following the line of the dress, which is following the line of the bouquet. And then this comes up to meet it. So like, again, everything's working for you. Um, this is like my version of the Melvin Salkowski one where the one on the left is lovely. Um, it's nice. I really wanted to show off the detailing and this gorgeous in ball drawer gown, but I have other photos from this shoot that did where this one on the right, um, it like kind of looks like Masonic imagery when I draw this all over it. Um, but you can see like these nice little triangles that are being created um, where like this is being cut off in that nice C very purposefully versus like that tiny little touch of it being cut off that I showed before, um, which echoes the bouquet. And we've got this nice V being created here in the background with the candles. Um, and this shot won the grand prize from Rangefinder um, I think two years ago, and I won $2,000 for it. So like this is my quantifiable, like that is better um, that I like to call my Melvin Salkowski version. Um, here, um, you can just see the way the ribbons trail. Like there's nothing inherently wrong with the one on the left, but there's so much more right about the one on the right. Um, here, a like, nice moment of um, talking from the uh, father of the bride, um, but here, like, he's really said something clearly hysterical, and he's got, like, that perfect, like, that's my decisive moment. He's got the perfect little finger out, um, and um, they're laughing, um, where, like, here she kind of looks uncomfortable, um, so it's looking for the moment where everything really comes together. Um, the um, always being ready for these moments too. This was right before the first look and I was like, oh, she's still primping. She needs a few more moments. Um, and his best man was like, oh, does he need more primping? And I like, started playing with his hair and I was like, oh, super funny. And I took a few shots and it, like this one is nice and would have been fine, but you can't see his eyes because I took three or four, I can find another where you can see him like looking at his best man being like, what are you doing? Um, and that creates a nicer moment. Um, the decisive moment can be like that moment of the cheersing. You've got this nice like triangle being created. Um, it can be something as simple as a change in pose. This was another image that I had pre-visualized for months and months and months before. Uh, and this one is kind of what I had been picturing. And when I saw it, I was like, it doesn't feel 100% right. Like something feels a little stiff to it to me. Um, and then I was like, oh, can you guys kiss? And the, their hat brims were like bumping up against each other. And I was like, oh, it's not working. Um, and I was like, oh, you know what? Can you lift her hat off and give her a kiss? And then all of a sudden it just became this magical moment. And like this, it's my sister and her husband, um, but this sells, um, as it's a, it's a card, it's a stock image. Um, it sells very well for me um, as a print as well. Um, and it just, I love the little heart shape it makes and it just, it's a, it just feels like so much more of a moment versus this, which feels very posed. Um, okay, so that goes into our posing flow. Um, so what I kind of talked about before with like that like serial killer thing and like making sure you're not, um, 
seeing yourself too much in the image. Um, so this is kind of how I start a lot of it, where I'm like, okay, we take the formal one, get it out of the way. Um, and now like, okay, give her a kiss. Um, and then I'll probably say something um, a little, and this is how I like to interact with my clients, we're all different. Um, I probably say something like teasing, um, like, oh, don't kiss her eyeball, or like, don't hug her that tight, like something to try and make them laugh. Uh, and then they usually laugh. Um, and then I'll like try to get something to get them to interact. Um, sometimes it happens naturally. Sometimes I'll be like, oh my God, like the face he's giving you right now. So then she turns around to look. Um, so it's finding ways to prompt without ever taking her clients out of the moment. Um, more posing flow of this couple. Um, I have them walking towards me. They get to the right spot where I want them, where I have these like nice little flowers in the foreground. I stop them, I get that formal photo, um, I come in closer, I have them turn in towards each other, we do a forehead touch, we do like an Eskimo kiss, um, which like, and this is every couple is different, I don't tell every couple to Eskimo kiss, I'm pretty sure they did that on their own, they were very cute, um, a kiss, and then pulled back. So this is how you can get like so much variation um, and keeping things looking authentic, um, and unique to your couples in a very quick amount of time. Like this was, all of these photos were probably taken in less than two minutes, I'd say, very quickly. Um, same with the bride here. And this is where like the, def the decisive moment, um, the pinnacle of action might be different depending on what you want. Like here we've got her smiling and looking really happy, a little bit more fashion forward of an image. Um, like her, like this is the one that was her favorite. This was the one that was her dad and her groom's favorite. Like, you know, just as, Alexei Brodovich and Alexander Lieberman had their different uh, photos. Your clients can all have different photos that are their favorite. So giving that variety and option um, is important. Um. Them. Um, so I mentioned tension before. One of the ways that we can get that decisive moment and kind of make our photos look like they're coming alive a little bit is having um, having a little extra something. So in this photo, uh, for me, the tension is the bride being on her tippy toes. Um, it's just that little bit of like movement in it of her like stepping up to like reach into his space um, that just makes it come alive a little bit extra. Um, and tension can be something um, like I call this the romance novel cover photo where I'm like pull him into you and it's that it's the same as you know putting the arm around the back of his neck um, and not just having it hang there but actually like grab on or the actual like pulling of a collar um, but it can also be a quiet moment like in the one on the right where they're leaning their heads against each other which some couples love to do and for some it's the weirdest thing on earth and they're like this feels so weird when it does feel weird I try to say like take a deep breath just like take a quiet moment like breathe each other in which sometimes is still super awkward and then you're like nope break it up like just kidding move on um, and you do something else that feels more natural to them um, um, but you can also like in that deep breath moment, you get this really sweet, intimate feel. Um, the decisive moment, excuse me, can also be um, like the perfect moment um, of um, the sparklers and everything coming in. And I will say like, like I will direct them when they're coming through the sparkler exit to like, give each other a kiss at the end and like pull him in. Um, but like stuff always happens and they get confused. Um, so like they kissed, but like we're kind of awkward. And I was like, no, 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 like don't keep your hand at your side. Like actually like grab onto her. And I say it in a very joking way because like all their friends are around. I'm like, I'm, like she's your wife, really grab onto her. Like whatever your prompt will be. Um, but that gets that tension in the image. Um, and like for me in this one, it's just her foot being up a little bit. Um, she had gotten exhausted of wearing her heels. This was like three hours into their engagement. She um, and I was like, girl, take them off. I do it all the time. Um, and um, she was laughing and I have some really funny photos of her laughing and them looking at each other. But this one with her foot just like up a tiny bit as she walks away was my favorite. And this, um, this is a greeting card as well and is one of my best sellers. Um, so it's that little, it's little extra somethings. Um, so the prompts that you can give to give tension, as I talked about, can be unique. I love using the word nuzzle, um, which I'll use with a couple, or like these are sisters on the left, and I'll try to make it feel as organic as possible. So um, with this bride's older sister, um, I was like snuggle in, and they kind of did, but like it didn't feel like right. Like you could feel that they felt awkward in front of the camera. And I was like, she was already, the older sister was married, and I was like, how does it feel for you to like watch your little sister get married? Like, 
what what emotions are happening through like what's going through your head right now and then like that's when they really connected and had this beautiful moment and they both started to cry after um so it's i mean i don't want to make my clients cry on purpose it's happy tears um but finding those little things that um can prompt it without taking someone out of the moment can cause that tension <clears throat> so uh, mood and narrative. One of the last things I kind of want to leave you guys with is the idea of um, color palette and the mood that we're creating within our wedding days or editorials or sh whatever we're doing. Uh, and this is um, visual cohesion. And this is something that I'm super passionate about because I have a background in editorial work and I love it. And this is where like I bring my fashion work into it. Um, I want to make sure that my weddings feel super cohesive from beginning to end. So everything from my, and like sometimes you're working with couples whose color palettes are all over the place and it just might not be possible. Um, but if your couple does have a strong color palette and vibe for how they want their wedding to feel, you should keep that in mind when you're shooting. So everything from where I pick for my first look and family portrait location to what I flat lay style against, everything is going to live in this little color world of what they've created. Um, so this is, um, something I did for my flat lay course uh, and I have different backgrounds but every single piece like they all look right together um, another example of like this Italy wedding um, and every single piece in here like you don't look at any of these and they pop out to you as like not belonging all of the colors as well as the vibe just fits together so sometimes asking your couple like what they loved about their venue or what they're like the more information you can get from them or their planner of what their day is going to look like the better um, I had a bride who got married at an art museum and I would have picked um, these really romantic spots to do their portraits in front of, but she told me that what she loved was how minimal it was, which I was like, this museum's not minimal at all. But then I kind of looked at it again and realized that some of the walls were, I mean, it was a lot of just stark marble. And that's what I ended up photographing everything in front of. And that was my first piece to run in print in Martha. Um, so it worked out because the rest of the day flowed. Um, this is the Not Dream Wedding, um, which again, I talked with um, Joe Meyer, who was the planner for it, a ton about what it was going to look like. So I made sure that every single piece like from the greenery and the flat lays to the locations that I took them outside for the photos everything would flow so I wouldn't all of a sudden have like a pop of red or like bright blue in this very gray white and green palette um, okay um, we've talked a lot about the hero angle. So this, it's shooting for publications, but also like she is, we're talking about the luxury market, um, shooting for your planners and designers. You wanna see every single uh, vendor for the day of a wedding um, as partially your client. Um, you don't really want them to bring their own photographer along. You wanna be the one who's shooting. So because of that, you wanna make sure you're getting the shots for them. Um, so being able, everything we've just talked about, all of these compositional tools is what you use to identify the hero angle. Um, so that's, you should be able to like look at a room and scope it out and be like, this is how it's going to look its best. Um, they've got leading lines, we've got our light, we've got our triangles, like whatever it is, you identify it and shoot it and they're gonna love it. Um, so you also want to think about how you're, like the multi-levels that you're uh, taking something on. So for the full tablescape, this is one where like you usually don't get to get that overhead shot. Um, so usually we'd probably start more like here, but it was nice that I was able to get it. Um, so we've got like kind of the empty room here, a single table, uh, a, a centerpiece with the stemware, um, the plate from overhead, the plate from an angle, uh, the flowers and the table number. So all of this together and making sure that I can deliver all of this um, from any situation I'm given. Again, when we're talking about being able to deliver something um, Co not cohesive or yes cohesive but um, dependable that like you're being hired the planner the client knows what they're going to get from you consistently um, having all of these shots down being able to identify the best angle on it quickly um, like a lot of times I have less than five minutes to get all of these photos done um, and you have to like move like the Tasmanian devil um, same with this one the this was a uh, elopement it looks like a style shoot it was a real wedding um, but the uh, the the full empty room is only one table here but going from that big all the way to the small of the lantern um getting all of those levels and having a planner um 
a planner recommend you for a wedding, they're going to want to know that you can do all of these. Um, manipulating the table uh, to get um, to kind of get photos like this and this. Um, Oftentimes it's not just clicking your shutter, like you actually are gonna wanna move things around on the table a little bit, try not to spill, um, be careful. Uh, but you can see how far the centerpieces are from the um, plates here. And this is an expensive, luxury, beautiful wedding, but if I were just to shoot it without moving anything on the table, I'm gonna make it look a lot cheaper because the florals are gonna look really small if they're only in this top half and then I'm gonna have this trapped empty space so it's a not gonna be a nice composition and B when we're talking about like that why and the what um, of the way we're shooting where the what is like we're making this very expensive wedding actually look cheap which we don't want to do um, so you can play up what's there as you are rising in your weddings and what you're shooting and you might not have the details yet um, but you're like I know I can do them um, sometimes you play around a little bit where this wedding um, was a mix of um, wood tables and rounds with tablecloths and they um, did not have chargers for anything but the head table and you better believe that I picked up that charger and shot it on like six different angles um, and then what I sent to style this was in like three different magazines and style me pretty um, front page and this is what they showed they showed the far away and then they show this singular close-up so you don't know when you look at this shot that every place setting doesn't actually have a charger and gold flatware it was only the head table that did um, and I'm not I'm not bringing something I'm not like bringing a charger in my purse it's something that was authentic to their day I'm just kind of tricking your brain in the way you're thinking about it and if you look at this hard you'll actually see half of the tables are still missing their centerpieces because they were still setting it but I had to go do golden hour photos and I was like you got to do what you got to do so I picked up the centerpieces from the back tables moved them to the front so they could be in my foreground because you can't really see that those in the back don't have. Um, so you work with what you got and you make it look its best. Um, same with this one. This wedding was in The Knot and was published a bunch of other places afterwards. Um, and this is what it looked like. It was folding chairs, cheap tablecloths, um, but they did a really cute little sweetheart table. Um, and this is what got sent to The Knot, not this. The Knot never saw that uh, on the left. Um, so you can be very, as you're trying to get into a more luxury market, again, where I started with like everything should be serving the ideal client, be really careful on what you share. Like I'm showing you this, I'm not showing anyone else that. I mean, obviously I deliver it to my client. Um, it's what their wedding day looked like and they get it. Um, but to the magazine, to the planner, to like the designer, they're getting this shot. Um, being able to constantly deliver that hero shot, as we talked about, um, being able to identify like the face of the bouquet. And this is a lot of playing around, like you're not gonna know it right away. Um, so always though looking at the like all the things we talked about at the beginning of this with the composition, um, the triangle shapes being made, the flow, just always things to have in the back of your mind. Um, creating additional details is a great thing um, if you're trying to get your work published, which is um, a great way to get your work seen as you're trying to rise um, in the luxury wedding market. So being able to, um, these are all flat lays, but they don't have to be like this is a three-dimensional bar vignette, um, which is something Thing I love to do where usually this doesn't exist like I will have the bartender make the drink I will pull in a flower um, the cocktail napkins and I make this little vignette which is something I used to do all the time in editorial um, fashion photography um, and not a lot of people think to do in weddings and it's super easy to do um, create all these little additional details um, these are more flat lays of it, um, but kind of some unconventional ones where like here, this is the favors, um, where I love um, using flat lays to um, show things that you wouldn't otherwise get to see. So like these were gonna come out at the end of the night, it was gonna be dark and certainly not opened. Um, so I can use a flat lay to show exactly what's happening. Um, perfect, um, and this is the further reading. So these are some of the things that I talked about and I wanna end, make sure I have, um, yeah, I want you guys to have a few minutes for questions, um, but I know like I have talked about so much and very fast, um, I apologize. Um, I wanted to cram everything in there. 
Um, I like to leave with the allegory of Plato's cave um, when I talk about semiotics, um, and you guys can Google it and watch it more. Um, but it's basically the idea um, of like once you see things, you can't unsee them. So if anyone hasn't read The Republic, um, it's an allegory of um, prisoners are stuck in a cave their entire lives. Uh, they're chained, um, staring at a wall with a fire behind them. So all they can see for their entire lives is shadows on the cave wall in front of them. So that's their reality to them shadows are what real life is. One day there's three prisoners, one of them escapes, goes out into the real world outside of the cave and is like, oh, there's color and three dimension. And like, I'm three dimensional and realizes that everything he ever thought was real isn't and was actually just mere shadow of reality. And that is what visual language can be, is once you can never go back. You can't go back into that cave and uh, accept shadows to be reality again once you i mean plato meant it as enlightenment um that was what the allegory was um which is kind of lofty to use in this context but i really like it because it's this idea of this all seems like so much to have in your brain and how do i keep it all straight and how do i have all of this while i'm actively shooting like it's just too much it's not because once once you realize that like it's not shadows you can't see any other way so i promise it does become very 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 second nature um, okay, so that is it. Questions? <laughs> Anybody? No? I said everything? I was trying to leave time for questions. <laughs> yes? When you're doing your multiple shots of mm -hmm. a particular scene, uh, are you changing any of your settings or are you just... It depends on what I'm doing. So for the one of, um, let's see if I can uh, pull it back up, the um, pigeon photo that I was talking about here. Um, this one, uh, I am um, bracketing here because I wanted the, the movement in the pigeon's wings and I didn't know, is it gonna be a 15th of a second? Is it gonna be an eighth of a second, a 30th of a second? Like which is gonna get me blur without too much blur? So if it's again like the intention of what I want to do, I will. Um, if I'm shooting something like backlit and I'm not sure like how much light I want coming in, uh, I might bracket there as well. Um, if it's just about the movement in someone, if it's like them walking towards me, then no, I'm not really changing things. Um, but I, if, it's, if the thing I'm trying to figure out is lighting um, or movement, then I will um, bracket and have a few different options. Um, same with like depth of field too, that often when I'm shooting those tables, um, I will shoot something every from like 2.0 to 4.0 or like even 5.6 because I don't know how much of the flower and the menu I want in focus and like what's the balance of getting the beautiful bokeh but still being able to read what the menu says. Um, so that's another time I'll bracket and then decide after. Yeah. Uh, with the, uh, the trying to catch the light, mm -hmm. um, are you ever using a tripod or? Are you yeah, this was shot on a tripod. Um, I can't remember what the winning image um, was. I think it was probably around an eighth of a second. I was telling the couple to stand very still. Um, I will use a tripod when I'm doing um, reception detail lighting because if the reception is at a quarter of a second or a full second. Uh, and I don't want to cancel out all that ambient light, I can only set my artificial light two stops higher. So I will shoot on a tripod for that um, as well. I almost always have a tripod with me. If it's an all outdoor wedding, I probably won't be using it. Um, but if there's an element indoors where I know I'm balancing light, then I absolutely will. Yeah, of course. Anybody else? There's a question online yeah. about what your preferred lenses and focal length um, great question. Uh, so lenses and focal length. Okay, it's like same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I try to shoot with the same um, setup for 99% of my day, um, which for me I shoot on a Contax uh, medium format film. I shoot with Kodak Portra 400, uh, and I love my 80 millimeter Zeiss lens on it, which is about a 50 millimeter lens um, on a non medium format camera. Uh, and I used to be like I used to be like such like an equipment like junky like I wanted every lens and every single piece and I would switch between them and my sophomore year of college I believe a professor was like oh calm down um, you have way too much going on like I don't I can't see your voice I don't know who you are I don't know what you're trying to say for the rest of the semester one lens one camera that's it I don't want to see anything else and I was so angry and I like went home like screaming at my roommate like this guy's 
expletive. Um, like, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm great. And they were like, well, he's the professor. He probably knows what he's talking about. And I tried, and I changed my life. Um, and I, from there, became like a one-lens gal. And that's most of the great artists that you'll see that uh, Avedon, Walker Evans, like anyone you go see hanging in MoMA, you can pretty much guarantee that they are shooting with one focal length almost the entire time because that's part of what defines your voice as an artist is what you're shooting with. Um, and for me, that's that 50 millimeter, which is pretty common for most portraitists. Any other online? Okay. Any other in person? I have a yeah. Uh, do you use any flash, like for example, if, if you wish? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll use flash um, for receptions um, quite often. Um, where am I? Um, I'll go to this one first. Um, this one on the bottom left, um, this one has a two flash setup there um, because all I had was that backlighting and I didn't want it coming in like super harsh and I wanted to make sure my skin tones look nice. Um, so I have two external flashes um, going. I think I actually had one external flash and then one that I was bouncing um, to get the look that I wanted um, and I wanted to try to keep it soft. And then for um, my receptions, um, for here we go, um, all of these um, have flash uh, and I'm, I usually like on-camera flash um, personally because, again, I'm trying to get a lot of that ambient lighting and when I have off-camera, it tends to get more of a cinematic quality and it's changing the light, which can be super beautiful. And again, like that's where we all get to be artists and make our own choices of what we like. Um, but all of these are shot with flash and it's just how I like to balance the flash and the ambient together. Um, great question. Um, I am always a team of three, at least, um, and really the only time I will be less than that is if it's like 10 people or less at the wedding. If there is more than 10 people, like literally if there's 12 to 15, I want that team of three. I grew up in LA, I grew up in movie industry, I love that dual camera. I want my A roll and my B roll, and I want um, the two looks on everything. Um, where like, if I'm wide, they're tight. If I'm looking at the couple, they're looking at the mom and dad watching the couple. Like I always like that dual perspective. Um, and a lot of times of the day, we just have to be split up and I can't be in two places at once, so I need a good second shooter. And then I always have an assistant. Rachel back there is one of my awesome New York assistants. Um, she's amazing. Um, anyone needs a great assistant here um, and Monica was one of my second shooters for many many years um, too busy with her own weddings now um, she's wonderful um, but they they've worked together on my team I think a bunch of times uh, and Rachel would always be by my side during the wedding day and I'm very particular of who I work with um, which again like this I say that my, my clients are like I do pretty high pressure weddings with these big budgets, but it doesn't matter if your client's budget's nothing, their wedding is just as important. Um, you still can't replace those memories if you screw them up um, and you can't put a dollar value on that. But um, I do feel the high pressure of it and I don't risk working with someone like one off. Um, I like to make sure that my team uh, knows what knows how to work with me, that like if I look at my second shooter and like, give them a nod, they know exactly what I mean. My assistant um, knows what I need before, like they count the clicks of my shutter and know when I'm reaching 16 on my film roll, have the next one ready, they know to give me water when I'm about to pass out, they like, they tell me to eat when it's a thousand degrees and I haven't in two days, like they, my team knows how to take care of me, which I say like you need so many systems in place on a wedding day, so when things go wrong, which they always do, or you just have a crazy schedule, um, you have all the systems in place like lined up to be able um, to facilitate everything going perfectly because you should be able like they're the venue could be on fire and the couple shouldn't know the couple should never know um, you should take them off into the corner and distract them while the planner puts out the fire and rebuilds it like that's what a perfect wedding day should always be so um, my if I bring on a new assistant they're usually um, following my old assistant for a few weddings first um, a lot of times my assistants will sometimes, or sometimes my assistants will become my second shooters or they'll, they'll shadow my other second shooters or they're my mentees um, who I've worked with for years, 
teaching them before they work with me. Um, so I always just know I have that consistent team um, and I travel with them because of that. Um, so for the wedding I had this weekend, one of my mentees flew up from Florida and another, Rachel had her own wedding, so another assistant came in from Connecticut who I've worked with also many, many, many times. Um, that answers. And if it's um, 350 people or more, I bring on a third shooter um, as well um, because that's just a lot for two people to handle. Yeah, these all four of these are digital actually up here right now. Uh, I I like to think of choosing film or digital like a painter would choose oils versus watercolor or the kind of canvas that they want to paint on. It's whatever is going to serve the situation best with the intention of what I want to create. So for um, and it's funny because I feel like people get really weird with film where like they get to be like real purists of like I only shoot film and I'm like I shoot whatever's gonna look best so like I don't not shoot film with flash because I don't know how I want a lot of ambient light and unless I have enough flashes to light up the entire space I can't get that two-stop balance uh, so that's where digital I can hike up my ISO and get more of that balanced light than I can with film. Uh, if I'm in uh, like the crazy dancing photos at the I love crazy dancing photos. My galleries are huge, especially for a film shooter. Like I'm a thousand to fifteen hundred photos at most of my weddings. And I, I mean, I already am broke from how much I spend on film, but I would be even more so if I was shooting five thousand dancing photos on film. Um, and it's also just not fast enough um, where digital does really well with that. So it's it's just whatever situation. Um, it's whatever material. Yes, yeah, at every wedding. It's very rare. Um, I think I've had like a few luncheon type, like non dancing, all daytime weddings where I've shot 99% film and then like maybe a couple digital um, at some point when like. I couldn't change my film fast enough, like during the ceremony or something, because um, I never want to miss a moment. That's uh, very important to me. Um, but yeah, otherwise, um, into lower light situations, into faster moments when I need both, um, I will absolutely uh, hybrid. Yeah, you had a second question. Yeah. Um, Sure, that's an interesting question in a lot of different ways. I will say imposter syndrome is real. Um, you never feel like you've made it. Um, that's just not a thing. If you're waiting to feel like you've made it, you're gonna die unhappy. Um, you just never will. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't be like confident in your work. Um, I felt from the get-go, I had this very like art school brat attitude, as I kind of alluded to before, of like, I don't want to shoot weddings. Uh, weddings are lesser than. And even though I got over that, uh, I still had an attitude of like, OK, if I'm going to shoot weddings, I want to shoot the kind of weddings I want to shoot, which doesn't necessarily mean expensive at all. Some of my favorite weddings have been non-crazy luxurious at all, um, but a very particular kind of client and a very particular aesthetic. And I was always, that was always my goal. So I let that drive me always more than money, more than, I mean, I had bills to pay, obviously, we all do. Uh, but that was always my driving focus. And everything else fell in line because of that. Um, so there was a tie. Also, like, I we're small businesses. Like, I feel like people forget that all the time as photographers, especially wedding photographers, we're small businesses. Most small businesses don't make money for their first, like, two to three years. And that's not because they're not doing a good job. It's because they're investing back in themselves. And I think that's something that a lot of, and obviously, like, we do have bills to pay. So, like, maybe for the first few years, you're supplementing, you're doing other things. But making sure you are taking the time to invest back in yourself, whether it be education. For me, it was the amount of film I shot. I mean, my first, 2013 was like my first real wedding season and I lost money on, I think, 80% of the weddings I shot that year because I didn't charge travel. I didn't um, charge enough for my services because I had nothing in my portfolio and I had to start somewhere. Uh, and I did not want to ever, um, hurt the quality of the work that I was doing. So during that full season, I was still shooting newborns and baby portraits and those dating profile headshots. I wasn't really showing it, but I had done enough already to like have that work coming in consistently without a lot of effort. Um, and that's how I paid my bills, where my wedding work was um, 
kind of more my passion work at that time and I knew I was investing in myself building to a place um, where I would say like midway through this year is the first time I felt that I'm at the price point where like I wanted to be for the, and I still would like to be a little higher for the amount of film I shoot um, and the quality of the team I have and what I pay them and traveling with them. Um, but until like June of this year, I would say I was still thinking that I'm investing in myself and I'm, I mean, that doesn't mean I wasn't like making money and running a good business, but in my head, I was still, my numbers weren't what they should be from a good business perspective of my cost of good versus profit because I was, investing in myself to get to a certain point. And it took, I started, I did my first wedding end of 2012, so it was seven years to get to a point where I felt comfortable. Yeah. Have you ever declined working on Yes. Yes, many times. Um, you have to be very careful with how you do it. Um, you never want to, I mean, you can get sued, like you can get sued for, um, declining business for a certain reason. People can say it's discrimination, which I have never declined a wedding because of anything discriminatory. I have declined a wedding because it was not an aesthetic that I wanted to be shooting. It was uh, maybe like a catering hall or a ballroom that I just knew wasn't gonna be something I really enjoyed um, and like served the best work that I can create. Or I just knew a client wanted something different than me and um, not you know we can't expect all of our clients to be so visually educated to 100% know what they want. Sometimes we need to listen to them and realize that we're not the right fit for everyone. Um, and I definitely I learned that from making mistakes. I took clients that I shouldn't have, and they weren't they were happy, but not like as happy as they could have been. And I certainly wasn't happy. Uh, and I realized this is not going to be right. So I'm always if I do turn something down, whether it's from the in initial inquiry, it's not someone a venue or something that sounds like it's going to be right for me, I tell them I'm unavailable and I will send it on to a million other amazing people in my network. Um, or if it's after that meeting, if it's with a planner, I might talk to the planner about why I don't feel like I'm the right fit for it and get a sense, am I right, am I wrong? Uh, or if it's just to the couple, like I might say like another couple's in the picture, like there's something else happening. You can never say to a client just like, I'm not the right fit for you. Like, no, because they might, like, even if you don't know what they look like, like they could say like that it's something discriminatory, um, which, not at all. Welcome everyone. Um, more diversity, the better. Um, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. How many weddings do you shoot a year? Um, it's a moving target. Um, I for the for 2017 and 2018, I did 28 and 27 weddings, um, which were a little too much. Um, this year, I capped it at 20, um, and I'm actually like I'm at 19. I'm really proud of myself that I stayed. I was like 15 to 20, um, so very happy with where I ended up. Um, I always. Um, especially like in the luxury, I mean, it seems counterintuitive, but in the luxury market, there's a lot of crazy like last minute weddings that get booked. Um, my first wedding over a million dollars, I think I was booked three months out. Um, that The budget, not what I was paid, I wish. <laughs> um, I could ask that, I wish. Um, but no, the first wedding, that the budget, where they, they booked me three months out and they planned the entire wedding three months out. Um, so there's always like something crazy that gets added on. So I try to like have it be a range of like 15 to 20 with like 20 being my hard stop for the last two years, 25 was my hard stop, and then both years it ended up going over. Um, and because so many of my weddings are destinations um, and multi-day events as well, it just became way too much. Um, and weddings are physical jobs, man. Like it impacts our health. Um, we have to take care of ourselves. <laughs> so, uh, but I have friends who um, work 100% locally in their own neighborhoods and do 40 weddings a year. And it's super easy. They're all six to eight hour weddings. They're single days. They can work double headers, no problem. Where like a lot of my weddings are three or four days. Like I could never do that. Um, so it's that balance. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for, oh, yep, one more, Jim's sorry. Love, you offer workshops? I do, I don't have any in-person planned right now. Um, this is like the craziest time of my wedding season. Um, so I've kind of paused on that um, and will be um, figuring it out in the end of December, what I will be planning for 2020. Um, my workshops are very different than a lot of the other workshops that are being offered right now they're not as much shooting intensive and they're a little bit more like of what we did today um, with 
but with portfolio reviews as part of it and really focusing on the artistry because my goal is always, I don't want someone to leave with a portfolio. I want someone to leave knowing how to create portfolio where the image is every time they click the shutter. Like that's always my goal. So my workshops are a tiny bit different, um, but I do, I have online courses as well um, that are available on my website. Um, and um, there will be workshops in 2020. I just don't know what they will be, but if you follow me on Instagram and like stay tuned on my website, they will be announced. Um, thank you. <laughs> well, thank, thank you guys.